happy Saturday. This week, we talked about Maria Arosa and her work on food autonomy at a time when U.S. policy was making the Philippines artificially dependent on American imports. One food that we did not mention, which does have a very important place in Filipino cuisine and culture and was introduced by the United States, that was spam. A lot of Spam's introduction into the Philippines happened through the U.S. Army during and after World War II. At that point, a lot of Maria Arosa's focus was really on feeding prisoners of war and civilians that were being held in an internment camp. Trying to get into the history of Spam felt like a sidetrack in that particular moment. But we do have a whole episode on the culinary history of Spam which talks a bit about how Spam became part of Filipino cuisine. We also have a little correction for it, which is that we mistakenly referred to Waikiki as an island. It is not, obviously. It's a city on the island of Oahu. Yeah, uh, obviously at that moment, we're talking about Hawaii. We are not talking about the Philippines. Um, Also, side note, we recorded the episode on Maria Arosa and the behind the scenes at this point, a couple weeks ago at least. I said at that moment I had not tried any Filipino spaghetti That was true at that time, but my spouse made it for dinner the other night. Uh, We did not have any hot dogs, though, so he substituted Spam, and it was very good. Delicious. So enjoy. Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. Holly, do you remember recently on our Facebook page when we had that weird influx of self published ebook spam? Yeah, like suddenly just tons of posts were showing up of people promoting their self published ebooks that often had nothing to do with history. No, none of them. And that was the only thing in, they had in common was that none of them were about history. <laughs> Otherwise, they were by different people, they were posted from different accounts, they were in different genres. It was very strange. And because I was wondering, maybe, you know, maybe there had been some article that had gotten passed around that was like, to promote your ebook, post on random people's Facebook pages. Uh, I posted on our Facebook page to say, sort of, hey, listeners, any of you have any idea why this might be happening? Um, a couple of people really went out of their way to yell at us and call us idiots for even asking that question. Most people kind of shrugged their shoulders virtually about it. Uh, A few people gave us suggestions for trying to, like, track down exactly what was going on. But a couple of people said, you know what would be cool is if you did an episode about spam the food, not spam, like, the unwanted e-communication, but spam the food. And I can get behind that because I will loudly and proudly say I quite enjoy spam. Yeah, well, (laughs) uh, and immediately from just the the few facts that I already knew about Spam's influence on various cuisines in the wake of World War II, I was like, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. That sounds actually pretty interesting and awesome. And then that led to several other people chiming chiming in with interesting tidbits about Spam and history. So that is what we are talking about today. Thank you, random people who put their weird ebook spam on our Facebook page. It was a for... circuitous journey, but we got to a cool episode idea. And I like sharing the journeys sometimes. Yeah. A lot of times people ask us how we come up with these things. Well, that's an example. <laughs> so, yes, today we are going to talk about spam's history and how spam played a part in some pretty important historical events, namely World War II and the Korean War. Yeah, so uh, in case anyone does not know, Spam is made by Hormel Foods. George A. Hormel was born in 1860 in Buffalo, New York. Now, their last name was originally pronounced Hormel to rhyme with normal, and it's not totally clear when Hormel became Hormel. Um, Because we've both been saying Hormel all our lives, and for the sake of consistency, we're just going to go with Hormel. That was definitely what the company was calling itself by the time Spam was invented. So uh, the Hormel family moved to Toledo, Ohio, when George was just six, and he worked in his father's tannery after school. The panic of 1873 meant that the family found itself needing additional income. So at the age of 12, George left school so that he could spend more time working and make more money for the family. 
After a few brief stints and a couple of other jobs, he wound up working at his uncle's meatpacking business, and he worked there until he was 19. And George continued to work in different jobs throughout his young adulthood. He was working as a traveling salesman uh, when he found a meat shop for sale in Austin, Minnesota, where he was passing through while he was doing some uh, business in his sales. And he bought this meat shop and he opened it, putting his experience at his uncle's meatpacking operation into practice and opening his own meat business. Soon, he really wanted the business to be more than just a butcher shop, so he borrowed some money found an investor, and established uh, George A. Hormel and Company. The George was just G-E-O with period after it. Uh, And they operated out of an abandoned creamery. That was in 1891, and at that point he was 31 years old. All of the United States' biggest meatpacking operations were in Chicago. And here he was in Austin, Minnesota, hundreds of miles away from that sort of nexus of industry. And he was also brand new. He was uh, a small business in an industry that at that point was completely dominated by really established longtime powerhouses. And he also didn't actually have some of the equipment that he was going to need to be a uh, you know, a large-scale meat packer. For example, he did not have refrigerated railed cars at his disposal. Those had been around since 1878, but George did not have any until after the turn of the century. So George Hormel needed to set himself apart in some way, since he couldn't just go head-to-head with all these giant established meat packing companies. He decided to focus on two things— The first was pork, since more of the pig carcass was used than in many other food animals, and quality. So when other businesses were cutting their pork products with with fillers, he really stuck as much as he could just to meat that came from pigs. And the company incorporated in 1901, and by 1924, they were slaughtering a million hogs each year. George Hormel's son, Jay, he had other sons as well, but Jay's the one who plays a part in this part of the story. He was a veteran of World War I, having served as chief quartermaster in the American Expeditionary Forces. Jay came back from the war with a sense of what canned goods could do in terms of feeding an army. So he encouraged Hormel to look into focusing on canned meat products. The company's first canned ham came out in 1926. In 1929, George Hormel retired, and Jay took at the helm uh, after his father was no longer part of the business. And at this point, Hormel introduced Dinty Moore Beef Stew and Hormel Chili. Uh, those both came out in 1935. At about the same time, the Hormel company recognized that it had a surplus of shoulder meat from pigs. Now, this wasn't a particularly popular cut of meat because neatly removing the meat from the bone was a really time- and labor-intensive process, and because a lot of consumers thought that it was inferior to other cuts of pork like ham. And what the Hormel Company decided to do was to grind up this shoulder meat along with some ham and add salt, water, a bit of sugar, and some sodium nitrate. Uh, That last ingredient preserves the color of the meat, and it also inhibits bacterial growth. Uh, And today, Spam also includes potato starch, but that was not in the original. It was added later to keep the liquid from seeping out of the meat and forming a gelatinous layer on top, which I remember seeing periodically in cans when I was a kid. And it was uh, indeed kind of gross. Yeah, that was in the 80s when they made that change. (laughs) Um, This new product's name was coined by Kenneth Dagenau, who was not only a Broadway actor, but also the brother of a Hormel VP. He won $100 for his efforts. It's allegedly a portmanteau of spiced and ham, but the specifics on that are really not documented, and Hormel claims that it what it really stands for is a closely guarded secret. That makes it sound like it's... Uh, somehow secretly spelling out horrible things that could be contained in it. But the important thing is that Spam took the world by storm. And we're going to talk about that after we have a quick ad break. And now we'll get to Spam and how it came to dominate the market. Yeah. Uh, So Spam made its entry into the market in 1937. And its launch was accompanied by a huge advertising campaign, and it billed Spam as suitable for every meal and for snacks. 
Spam was basically an instant hit, and it took 18% of the market share for canned ham in its first year. That is hugely significant. The U.S. was starting to recover somewhat from the Great Depression, but overall, people were really excited about having access to an inexpensive, shelf-stable source of meat. Plus, its really long shelf life meant that you could stock up when you had extra money, and you would have like a nice little uh, go-to in your pantry of edibles. Spam also got an endorsement from George Burns and Gracie Allen on their radio show. There's a charming, depending on your taste, a print ad for both Spam and the show, in which George says to Gracie, Gracie, if a strange man offered to buy you lunch, what would you say? And then Gracie replies, Spam! I think it's charming. (laughs) But it is pretty charming. Basically, everything those two did was charming to me. Um, also on that print ha- ad was the copy, Cold or Hot, Spam Hits the Spot. Cold Bits, Spam and Vegetable Mold, Spam and Salad, Sandwiches. Hot, Spam and Eggs, Spam and Waffles, Baked Spam, Spam Burgers. A singing radio commercial also came out in the 40s that began and ended with the word Spam, 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 Spam. And to look at it, As I did look at it many times as I was doing research, uh, it looks a lot like the Monty Python sketch. But in reality, it was sung to the tune of My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. Now, I just wish someone could convince Terry Jones to sing the spam song in his spam lady voice to My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean. I bet we could. We'll start a campaign. Uh, (laughs) World War II really launched spam into the American patriotic consciousness. U.S. residents were encouraged to give up beef and premium cuts of other meats so that they could help the war effort, and spam was a handy alternative. Yeah, so while people were eating spam out of necessity toward the end of the Great Depression because it was cheap and they didn't have a lot of money, this time it was more of a sacrifice to support the United States. Um, The Hormel Company, along with other meat producers, made specially packaged army versions of spam. These were basically extremely large Spam loaves and olive drab tins. Then they weren't branded as Spam with that distinctive blue Spam label. They contained some extra salt so that they could withstand the temperature extremes of all the places that the troops were deployed. Uh, There were also some ordinary cans of Spam that were basically bought in a pinch to try to make ends meet for the men's rations. Hormel wound up providing at least 100 million pounds of spam during World War II. That's a lot of spam. It's so much spam. It's a running theme in World War II soldiers' discussions of the war. (laughs) And for the troops, the word spam actually came to mean any kind of processed and preserved meat. And it was on the menu a lot. It often seemed like it was three three meals a day every single day. So... Spam three meals a day didn't literally mean brand name spam, but processed meat three meals a day. Yeah, people basically thought of all of that stuff as spam. It's it's similar to how all tissues are Kleenex. And that is the thing that Hormel tries so hard to combat. <laughs> yes. In 1966, when the Hormel company was celebrating its 75th birthday, Dwight D. Eisenhower wrote in a letter to a retired Hormel president saying, quote, I ate my share of Spam along with millions of other soldiers. I'll even confess to a few unkind remarks about it, uttered during the strain of battle, you understand. But as former commander-in-chief, I believe I can still forgive you for your only sin, sending us so much of it. That so much of it meant that a lot of servicemen swore they would never touch another can of Spam once the war was over. And while this may have been true, at least temporarily... Many people who had sworn never to touch another piece of Spam wound up feeling a little nostalgic for it once the war was over. Eating Spam took on this patriotic air, and it was uh, bolstered, this concept of patriotism linked to Spam, by Hormel's advertising campaign, which tied Spam to wholesome values and patriotic spirit, and that uh, advertising plan went on throughout the 50s. It was also bolstered by a 60-member dance troupe known as the Hormel Girls, who toured around in USO fashion after the end of the war after getting their start in 1947. I hope we have pictures of those. I saw a couple. I did not find any 
that we can like put in our blog or anything. Gotcha. But there are some. That could be a great Halloween costume. (laughs) The combination of nostalgia and patriotism uh, meant that Spam's heyday in the U.S. really ran through the 50s and the 60s. Cookbooks featured Spam as an ingredient in all kinds of dishes. But as the 70s crept in, Spam's popularity started to fade a bit. On December 15th, 1970, the last skit on that night's episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus was the infamous Spam sketch, in which a couple goes to a cafe where they're serving a lot of Spam, and then there are Vikings who also sing about Spam. Then on December 31st, 1974's episode of MASH, Hawkeye and Trapper John saved Radar's pet lamb for being slaughtered for a feast by sculpting a new one out of Spam. Weird Al Yankovic's Spam song, sung to the tune of R.E.M. Stand, came out in 1989, at which point the canned meat had really become cemented in the American consciousness as both a joke and junk food. People started to think of Spam as mystery meat made of remnants the way that hot dogs are reported to be, even though its ingredients had not changed, aside from that addition of potato starch that we talked about earlier. And today, people really kind of think of Spam as dated and cheap. Uh, at least most people. Yeah, in, in the United States. This is not the case in several other parts of the world. So to talk about spam uh, in other parts of the world, we need to zip back to World War II for a minute. In the United States, the Lend-Lease Act was passed on March 11th, 1941. And as its name suggests, the Lend-Lease Act allowed the United States to lend or lease supplies and materials to allied nations without payment if doing so was, quote, vital to the defense of the United States. So this was a way for the United States to help the war effort without actually committing troops, which would happen eventually after the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th of the same year. Through the Lend-Lease Act, Spam made its way to Russia. In Nikita Khrushchev's memoir, speaking of World War II, he says, quote, There were many jokes going around in the army, some of them off-color, about American Spam, but it tasted good nonetheless. Without Spam, we wouldn't have been able to feed our army. Spam also made its way to several other parts of the world through the Lend-Lease Act and through the presence of American troops during the war, along with other military actions. So we're going to talk specifically about Hawaii, which at this point was not yet a state, as well as the Philippines and South Korea. And in Hawaii, Spam's influence came from two sources. One was the American GIs who were stationed there or who passed through Hawaii on their way to other parts of the Pacific. The other was Hawaii's Japanese population. So during World War II in the continental United States, the government forced many Japanese Americans into internment camps. This is absolutely a thing that is on the list for a podcast episode later on. Um, Consequently, Spam sometimes makes makes an appearance in Japanese American food because it was one of the uh, foods that was being served in the camps. But Hawaii was not yet a state, so the United States government could not really begin interning its citizens. I mean, you can make an argument that the United States government shouldn't have been interning its citizens without due process in the first place. It super did not have that authority to do in Hawaii. Also, the Japanese population of Hawaii was just too big to be interned. There were way too many people of Japanese ancestry. The camps that would have been required were too large for the islands themselves to be able to support. There was just no way that the United States could do in Hawaii what it was doing in the continental United States. Instead, uh, to combat this perceived threat from people with Japanese ancestry, restrictions were placed on the movements and activities of people uh, that were of Japanese descent in Hawaii. So Japanese Hawaiians were banned from deep sea fishing, which had been one of the ways that they um, primarily sourced their food for the Japanese community. Because of Hawaii's remote location, its landscape, and the available food sources, the easiest protein source for Japanese Hawaiians to use to replace what they'd lost from deep sea fishing was spam. Consequently, 
Spam has been incorporated into many Japanese dishes, and these vary based on different ethnic groups who live in Japan. But in particular, there is a lot of sort of Hawaiian-Japanese spam fusion. Mm, There's a yummy restaurant here in Atlanta that does a yummy um, spam entree with gravy and deliciousness, and I absolutely love it. Uh, The most famous example of the Spam dishes that they were making at this time, though, is Spam Musubi, which is Spam over rice. It's wrapped in nori seaweed, and it's sometimes erroneously called Spam Sushi. It does kind of resemble a sushi roll, but Musubi is its more accurate name. Today, Hawaii is, of course, a state and consumes more spam than any other state. And the island of Waikiki hosts an annual spam jam. Let's go. Um, (laughs) Thanks to the presence of GIs during World War II and an ongoing military presence thereafter, spam also became very popular in Guam and Okinawa. In Korea and Japan, citizens were really just desperately suffering during World War II, As a side note, if you have not seen the Japanese film Grave of the Fireflies, this will give you an idea of how desperately hard things were for Japanese citizens during the war. Canned meats like Spam really saved people's lives and consequently became incorporated into local cuisines there as well. In South Korea, this continued during the Korean War. American soldiers stationed there, not considering spam to be particularly valuable or important, were happy to use it as trade and to increase goodwill. And they would also sell it on the black market later on. And during the Korean War, the United States Army's Postal Exchange, or PX, was often the only place that people could get meat. Spam was really what was available, and since people couldn't afford to buy it necessarily from the PX, it really came to be considered a luxury. Um, It's an ingredient in a dish called boudé jigae, which I hope I am pronouncing correctly, which is also called military stew. And that's basically a thick stew that also includes Korean ingredients like kimchi. A fried slab of pork called puyuk was also part of Korean cuisine before the introduction of Spam. And Spam became a replacement for pork in that dish when people couldn't get a hold of regular pork. So Spam is undoubtedly an economy-class food in the United States, but it's a little more expensive in Korea. And this association with scarcity and expense from earlier times means that today it's frequently given as a really high-class gift, Often this is part of a really elaborate gift box that includes other foods. Korea is consequently the world's second largest consumer of Spam after the United States. And Spam similarly became popular in the Philippines as an after effect of U.S. military presence. Today in the Philippines, uh, it's often purchased outside of the country by people who are traveling for pleasure or business and then brought home with them as traditional homecoming gifts. Uh, This means a lot of times if you're in duty-free shops at airports that cater to a lot of Filipino travelers, there will be spam in the duty-free shop. And spam is traded in the Philippines on both the black and the gray markets, and there are actually nine different legitimately available varieties of spam there. There is even a turkey version for the nation's Muslim population. So I wonder what that tastes like. I also wonder what that tastes like. (laughs) Um, The reason that there is a black market and a gray market for spam is is that uh, there are some restrictions on imports in the Philippines, which means there's more demand for spam than is actually allowed to be imported. Um, And when when you look at the numbers of the number of cans sold versus the number of people allowed to sell it, it just doesn't add up. There is additional spam coming from somewhere. (laughs) So there's a legitimate argument to be made here that all of these examples are examples of undue American influence on other cultures. But in the case of Spam in particular, local cuisines have really taken Spam and then absorbed it and made it into something that is uniquely their own. Whereas in the United States, people were usually basically using Spam as a substitute for other meat rather than making something new and uniquely Spam out of it. And today, Spam is distributed in more than 50 countries, and it's trademarked in more than 100. There are actually two Spam cans in the permanent collection at the Smithsonian in in the Division of the History of Technology. 
One was the original 1937 can, which had to be opened using a key, and the other is a more modern luncheon meat can, which was introduced in 1997, which I think has the pull tab style. Uh, And the look of the label for Spam has stayed basically the same all this time. Spam was also served at a breakfast at the opening of a World War II exhibition at the National Museum of American History. And to circle back a little bit to Spam's manufacturer, Hormel is still majority owned by family, but it's no longer really family run. Family still owns it, but other professionals of running things uh, are in charge of the company. I also, in this episode, had a whole rather lengthy section about labor history at the Hormel company, which has some actually very interesting twists and turns and contradictions. There were parts of the company's history that were really revolutionary in terms of labor relations. And then there are other parts of the company's history in which there were really contentious and heated strikes. And then in one case, uh, a strange autoimmune disease that cropped up at one of its meat suppliers. Yikes. But it's just a whole long series of things. Um, And then as I, you know, went through this outline to edit it, all seemed extremely ancillary to the story of Spam. So <laughs> I I don't think we will have a whole episode on the history of labor relations at the Hormel Company, but if you are interested in such a thing, I will put the links to my sources on that in our show notes. There you so go. So you can check them out for yourself. Uh, I um, Most of, of my research for this sort of fell on either side of a weekend, And on the Friday part, I kept being like, maybe I should go get some Spam and eat it. Because I don't, I'm not sure I've ever eaten Spam. I'm sure I did at some point as a child. What? We have it in our three. Yeah, I know. Uh, I know I've had chip beef on toast. That I know for sure. That's not the same at all. (laughs) No, but it is is another (laughs) kind of military joke food. Uh, We definitely have Spam in our three-day emergency kit. You know, in case there's some kind of disaster. Yeah. Yeah. So that was sort of Friday. And then on Monday, I had these resources that had all of these spam recipes. And I kept being like, that sounds disgusting. Like the the ones that were, um, you know, the the military stew and the spam musubi, like that sounded really interesting to me. But then there were ones that were American foods that were made with spam. And I was like, that's the grossest thing that I have ever heard of. I'm, I'm not throwing any shade to spam, but man, people have put together some gross sounding recipes. Yeah, that's not one specific to spam. Escargot. There are lots of non-spam gross recipes. Yeah, okay, one of them was fake escargot, and I'm just going to leave it. <laughs> it's like Spam's Halloween costume. I don't even know what that is. Yeah, um, I, I, have, I like escargot, and the idea of using Spam to make uh, fake escargot really grossed me out. Thanks so much for joining us on this Saturday. Since this episode is out of the archive, if you heard an email address or a Facebook URL or something similar over the course of the show, that could be obsolete now. Our current email address is historypodcast at iheartradio.com. You can find us all over social media at Missed in History. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.